It's been said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Jesus lived in a world of tyranny. His homeland had been under the thumb of one empire or another for hundreds of years. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, Greeks, Seleucids, and now the Romans had all swept through these lands, each of them imposing their own flavor of imperial power, some more or less benevolent than others. As a Jew, Jesus knew all too well the pain and humiliation of being oppressed by imperial overlords. Pontius Pilate, the local governor of Judea, was just the latest in a long line of tyrants that the local folks had to contend with. Jesus knows all about worldly power. He knows what it looks like. He knows what it feels like. Given the adoration of his followers, he even knows what it tastes like. And Jesus wants nothing to do with it. Good morning. Our reading this morning from the book of John, chapter 18, 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations upon all of our hearts, serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. There are few kings left anymore, and fewer still with any real power. Some nations still embrace the notion of a monarchy, places like Thailand and Belgium, even England, though most of these are constitutional monarchies with parliamentary branches of government. The king is little more than a figurehead. Of course, there are plenty of authoritarian strongmen in the world, and they usually are men, who'd still like to be king, given half the chance, but they still have to negotiate the checks and balances of their nation's constitution, frail as those may sometimes prove to be. But even for the man who would be king, or the woman who would be queen, a certain amount of decorum is expected. You know, the appropriate wardrobe, the proper appearances, the eloquent speeches. One is expected to behave according to the dignity of their office. As such, there are certain things a monarch simply does not do. A king, for instance, would not sneak into your bedroom in the middle of the night and slip a hamburger onto your nightstand. A king wouldn't be lurking around outside your window first thing in the morning waiting to hand you a breakfast sandwich. And a king certainly wouldn't ascend the scaffolding of a skyscraper to give a cup of coffee to a tired construction worker. And yet, in the fantastic world of Burger King commercials, that is precisely what a king does. Roll that tape. Wake up with BK Joe. 100% Arabica beans. Decaf, regular, and turbo strength for you, sleepyhead. New BK Joe. Wide awake with the king. 
Burger King has always struggled with its marketing, um, <laughs> which tends to be weird and slightly unsettling, as you can see. This is the same company that made a commercial about a, a man who writhes across the floor of a Burger King restaurant uh, in order to get to a Whopper, which he then extends his jaw uh, like, a, like a snake, you know, to consume it in one bite, much as a snake would eat a small woodland creature. For a while, the company adopted the king as their mascot. This character with a freakishly large head and a broad, chilling smile, who never speaks and who seems to appear in the most inappropriate places, often lurking outside of people's windows like a peeping Tom. He's a benevolent monarch, I guess. I mean, he hands out free hamburgers and other specialty menu items that Burger King wants to promote, like their French toast breakfast sandwich or their Cheeto-flavored chicken fries. Unlike Marie Antoinette, this king is not content to let his people eat cake. But for all of his generosity... The king really polarized audiences. I mean, look at him. He's just plain creepy. As the company's former CFO once said, the creepy king character tended to scare away women and children. The king has also been seen in the company of controversial celebrities like champion boxer Floyd Mayweather when he inexplicably appeared as part of Mayweather's entourage before a highly publicized fight with Manny Pacquiao. Now, some folks criticized Burger King for the publicity stunt, given certain criminal allegations against Mayweather, to which the company's PR firm replied cryptically, we don't call him the king for nothing. Whatever that means. <laughs> but love him or hate him, Burger King's iconic mascot is hardly a conventional ruler. And maybe that's just as well, because the real ones tend to be just as creepy and far less benevolent. Let's talk about Pontius Pilate, for instance. Now, Pilate wasn't a king, but he might as well have been in his little corner of the world. He was a prefect, a governor with total authority over the region. A little Caesar, if you will, assigned to a backwater post in Judea where he could bully the populace and throw his weight around to his heart's content. And we have a few different historical records of Pilate from which we can construct a reasonably accurate portrait of the guy. Specifically, he appears in Philo of Alexandria's work, as well as accounts by the Jewish historian Josephus. And of course, the Gospels, uh, as well as a couple of other brief mentions by other Roman historians. Now, the Gospels portray Pontius Pilate in a relatively favorable light, oddly enough. I mean, yeah, he gives the order to execute Jesus, but only after immense public pressure. In the Bible, it's clear that this isn't something that Pilate wants to do or takes any pleasure in, hence his literal washing of his hands after the matter. But the Gospels are biased. Some of their authors, like Matthew, for instance, had a particular interest in demonizing the Jews, the Jewish authorities had treated the early Christ followers rather badly, you see, and Matthew's entire gospel is something of a polemic against them. Hence, after Pilate washes his hands in that gospel, the Jews declare of Jesus, his blood shall be on our hands and on the hands of our children. In other words, for Matthew, Pilate isn't really the bad guy, at least not the worst guy, not as bad as some others. As for the other Gospels, well, it was in the author's best interest to minimize any critique of Rome or its governors. Remember, these were written in the years following the Jewish revolt that Pastor Kendra talked about last week, after the Romans had leveled the temple to the ground. Hardly a good time to be stirring up more political tension with Rome. This is all to say that despite his favorable portrayal in the Gospels, Pontius Pilate was not a nice guy or a benevolent ruler. According to Philo and Josephus, Pilate frequently antagonized the very people he'd been sent to govern. On one occasion, he moved a series of Roman standards into the temple under the cover of darkness, desecrating 
the space with pagan symbols, knowing that it would infuriate the Jewish populace. Similarly, he also mounted a series of golden shields with Roman iconography on the walls of Herod's palace, causing a public outcry. Herod's sons actually went over Pilate's head and uh, petitioned the emperor, Tiberius, who sternly commanded Pilate to take them down. It was Pilate's job, after all, to maintain the peace, a task that he was ill-suited for and seemed to have no interest in. There were other incidents, too, like the time Pilate used money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct. Protesters gathered at the site of its construction, and Pilate ordered his soldiers to beat them to death with clubs. And then there was the slaughter of a village of peaceful Samaritans, the last straw that finally got Pilate recalled to Rome, where he disappears from the historical record. Pontius Pilate is not a man who is inclined to share power. And here in this text, we find him masking Jesus, if he is in fact a king, the king of the Jews. Pilate is feeling threatened. His authority is threatened by this wandering preacher from Nazareth. And if there's one thing a tyrant fears, it's losing his power. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asks Jesus. Jesus redirects the focus, changes the subject, puts it back on Pilate. You see, Pilate like most of us, if we're being honest, has succumbed to worldly notions of power. As an upper-class nobleman, he is completely unable to think beyond the system that he inhabits. No more than a fish can recognize the water that it swims in. That system is a vast hierarchy of emperors and slaves, most people caught somewhere in between. Now, that includes Pilate himself, a glorified middle manager with delusions of grandeur. And he's determined to step on everyone beneath him in order to exercise what little clout he has. He's comparable, I think, to a certain breed of politician, the ambitious mayor who wants to be a senator, the senator who wants to be president, or the president who wants to be king. Each of them determined to wield whatever power they have in a desperate bid to gain still more. Worldly power, Pilate's power, is the authority to boss people around or make the rules. It's the power to decide who lives and who dies. It's the power trip a person gets when they hold an assault rifle or when they take a life. It's the power of the judge, the jury, and the executioner. I'm reminded of the words of poet John Milton, spoken by Lucifer after his fall from grace. To reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And that's the conventional wisdom, really, when it comes to power. And it really does make a hell of earth. Worldly power subjugates people, subverts justice, and subjects the very planet to our abuse. Jesus doesn't want that kind of power. My kingdom is not of this world, he explains. You see, Jesus wields an entirely different kind of power. It bears no resemblance to traditional notions of authority, upends the conventional social order. In Jesus' kingdom, he declares that the last shall be first and the first shall be last, that the meek will inherit the earth, that we should share our wealth, that we should love our enemies, and that we ought to serve one another rather than dominate one another. So you are a king, Pilate replies. Confused, baffled, utterly incapable of grasping the kind of world that Jesus is talking about. And it's easy to judge Pilate for that. But can we really claim to understand it either? Or are we also blinded by this system, by this world that we inhabit? 
Maybe the king, the Burger King, that is, is a more conventional monarch than I'd given him credit for. In fact, he bears an uncanny resemblance to a lot of politicians and so-called leaders. Take a closer look. Consider his enormous head, so inflated that it can scarcely fit through the door. Look upon his cold smile, that rictus grin, joyless and made for television. Watch how he hands out cheap junk like empty promises. And don't forget that he's on the payroll of a multinational corporation who's really pulling his strings. I don't trust him. (laughs) And friends, don't even get me started on Mayor McCheese from McDonald's. Jesus had no interest in wearing a crown, no interest in worldly power. But what about us? Do we? Do you? Do I? Pontius Pilate was right about one thing. Our world is a vast hierarchy of power, a civilization of dominion and subjugation, rulers and subjects, emperors and slaves. It's a world that suited him well, a man who'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. But is that the kind of world we really want? Maybe wielding a different kind of power we can build a better one. Amen.